All right, I think it's time to begin this morning. Thank you all for coming. I realize it's early on Saturday morning. Maybe it doesn't count as early here, but for us in the US, uh, asking anybody to do anything at 9 o'clock on a Saturday morning is asking a lot. So thank you for coming. And I would also like to thank the organizers of the conference, uh, UC Berkeley, Academia Sinica, Professor Ye, Professor Wu, for giving us this uh, wonderful opportunity to come together across disciplines to talk about cross-strait issues and issues of relevance to cross-strait relations, whether or not they are directly uh, implicating cross-strait interactions. Um, I also want to commend the organizers for choosing a format that allowed us to meet so many new colleagues. Uh, Professor Wu and I were just talking about how the political science conferences are usually the pretty much the same cast of characters, and a lot of the, our arguments have become pretty familiar. Um, but in this conference, I've met all kinds of people that I, I don't think I would have met before, both uh, Taiwanese colleagues whom I expected to meet, but also American colleagues uh, that I didn't realize I needed to meet, but now I'm very glad to have met. So it's a, a very well-organized enterprise. And it's always uh, wonderful for me to be here at Academia Sinica, which is where I had my first academic uh, contact with Taiwan in 1983. I visited Chu Haiyuan at his office in a decrepit, crumbling old building at the old Minzu So. And he was so generous. I was a college student. There was no reason why he should want to be willing to talk to me, but he did. And he handed me a, a small kind of underground publication. And he said, this is a, a book of poetry created by Aboriginal students at uh, the universities here in Taipei. And it's kind of an underground publication. But he said, this is the beginning of a movement. So keep your eyes on it. Um, and then in 1991, I came back as a graduate student and had an office at the Minzu Saw in the beautiful, fantastic new building, which I still think is the uh, most romantic academic building in the world. Um, <laughs> And just yesterday discovered that one of my former students from Davidson College is uh, Matthew West, is now a graduate student in anthropology at uh, Columbia and has an office in the beautiful romantic Minzel Saw as a, a graduate student researcher. So it's really a, a pleasure to be back here. Before we begin with the papers, I want to say something to uh, kind of contextualize this panel in the framework of the conference, which is really just about heading Tim off at the pass so that he doesn't get to ask the question that he asked yesterday, what does this have to do with cross-strait relations? Um, we, have, we originally had two papers on Taiwanese living in mainland China. Unfortunately, one of our presenters uh, was unable to, to make it today. But we have one paper that's clearly on a cross-strait topic, but two papers that are based on data collected entirely in Taiwan. But I think that this is important and relevant for cross-strait relations because the development of cross-strait relations depends upon social development and political and economic development on both sides of the strait. We spend a lot of time looking at the PRC and, and trying to gauge how the PRC may align itself with Taiwan in ways that may make Taiwanese more comfortable with a, a higher level of integration or interaction. But these papers, I think, point the arrow in the other direction and say, what do we need to know about Taiwan to see whether people in the mainland will be comfortable with a higher level of integration uh, with us. So this has to do with uh, the integration theory that Professor Wu was talking about yesterday and also Zhu Yunhan's uh, concept of soft power. You know, trying to figure out whether the two sides can grow together. Actually, we have to look at both sides to judge whether there is the uh, foundation for growing together or not. 
So that is how I think these papers actually do fit the mandate of the conference. So let us begin then uh, with the paper by uh, Fan Yun and uh, Zhang Yuxing. Uh, Fan Yun has her PhD from Yale University and is a professor of sociology at National Taiwan University. And her co-author, Zhang Yuxing, is uh, a graduate of Tsinghua University and is currently working at uh, Taida as well. And their paper is Gender Politics in Deliberative Democracy, the Case Study of Women's Participation in Taiwan's National Youth Forum. OK. okay. It's an honor for us to be here. My co-author, Yuxing Zhang, and I would like to thank Professor Rieger for her invitation. Okay. The paper we are going to present today is on gender politics in deliberative democracy, a case study of women's participation in the Na National Youth Forum. Okay. Public and public-spirited talk has increasingly come to be seen as the core of strong democracy. Communitarians, pragmatists, and critical theorists alike have been converging on the idea of deliberative democracy in the past two decades. Deliberative democracy is thought to increase levels of civic engagement, the quality of policies, and the citizens' trust in political institutions. With the help of scholars, the local and the central Taiwanese government have begun implementing deliberative democracy and holding different types of citizen conferences in Taiwan since the year 2000. The topic discussed vary from policy issues such as health insurance and community development to controversial social issues like the death penalty. During 2004 to 2006, Taiwan held at least 30 uh, consensus conferences. In fact, you might be surprised that uh, Taiwan held the most consensus conference in the world during those two years. Okay. This leads us as sociologists to pose a basic question. Are the decisions in deliberative democracy more just and fair as those advocates, um, they say? Um, arguments for the virtue of deliberative democracy are, first, it enhances the legitimacy of collective decision making because it emphasizes equity and inclusion. Disadvantaged groups like women are invited to join the decision making process. Second, it can help citizens shift their concern from private interest to public interest because it offers citizens sufficient and impartial information during the discussion. Deliberative democracy may help con uh, conciliate conflicting values, such as the conflict between women's rights of self-decision and the rights of an embryo in the issue of abortion. Even if participants do not change their minds, they will likely come to recognize a greater range of preferences as legitimate. Finally, people can ameliorate, am, ameliorate the previous policies and create better and efficient ones when they have sufficient information on a particular issue. However, critics of deliberative democracy argue that even if people are granted access to deliberative forums, they are not equally able to have influence in the decision-making process. Men, white people, native speakers of official languages, and those with cultural capital are more likely to be heard since the existing social inequality are bracket, using Nancy Fraser's term. Deliberative democracy in its present form lacks cultural pluralism to encourage disadvantaged groups to speak up. In addition, the basic ideas of common good and reaching a consensus can suppress many issues within the private sphere. Lastly, there's still no guarantee that the government's decision making can be influenced. Okay, so now which sign is right? Obviously, we just need empirical research to tackle them one by one. The research question of this paper are, 
does gender inequality still exist in deliberative democracy? Or in other words, do women and men have equal opportunity and power in making decisions? Our study case uh, was held by Executive Yuan. There were 40 participants and they aged between 18 to 30 years old. They all had college degree or above. And there were half participants were women. So quantitatively, the forum at least achieved the equality of gender and education. Our research methods are content analysis and in-depth interview. We analyzed participants' seats, their speaking numbers, speaking lengths, and how did they impact the final decision. Um, among the 40 participants, 11 participants, five males and six females were interviewed about their attitudes and feelings about the forum, and how did they deal with conflicts. Our question, the first question is, does gender equality exist in del deliberative democracy? We counted participants' speaking numbers, speaking length, and the numbers of consensus opinions and uh, modified opinions. We found that men's speaking frequency is 68.8% and women's is 31.2%. So men's frequency of speaking doubles that of women's. It is stat uh, statistics significant in gender difference. And this table shows that men provide 64.6% .6 consensus and 73.3% modified opinions in the forum. Um, because men spoke more than women, they not only provide more consensus, but also had more chance to modify others' opinions. Okay, thank you for uh, Zhang Yuxin for presenting the research matter and the quantitative part. Okay, so our next question is, how do men and women influence the decision-making process by analyzing the visual data of video recordings and the reports of consensus opinions? We find that expert knowledge and building alliance are the main factors that affect the constituting of final consensus opinions. Based on our observ observation, men were more likely to play the role of experts in their groups and also use expert knowledge to impact their consensus opinion. And an alliance is usually composed of one deliberator and supporters. And without being in an alliance, women with expert knowledge cannot influence the final consensus. Okay. When we further look at the internal dynamic in the alliance, we find men were more likely to be leaders and women were subordinate to them. Even in an alliance, women, landed, uh, women tended to ask questions and or lend support to their allies. Okay. In short, uh, we have found that compared to women, men are much more active in deliberative democracy. And in terms of inference, male participants are much more powerful than those female participants with the same educational background. We have also found that as per knowledge and building alliance are the main factors that affect the constituting of consensus opinion, especially the latter one. No matter whether participants possess the knowledge about the issue under discussion or not, they can only reach a consensus in terms of opinion via building an alliance with others. Paradoxically, building alliance has positive and negative effects on women. In this case, we have found that building alliance helps strengthen women's individual impact on the one side, but consolidate men's dominant power on the other. In light of Iris Young's concept of external exclusion and internal exclusion, we will try to explain the complicated relationship between alliances, knowledge, and women's attitude and behavior preferences, and how these factors diminish women's power in the forum of deliberative democracy we observed. External exclusion means that some people or groups cannot participate in the decision-making process. Others can dominate the entire process of discussion 
discussion and decision making thanks to their economic and political clout. Among the numerous types of external exclusion, the most typical one is what referred to as the backdoor brokering, wherein powerful people discuss issues privately outside of the formal meeting, and their private decisions could be the final conclusion. Young define internal inclusion as a phenomenon wherein some people cannot influence the decision-making process despite being present in the discussion because of lack, of lack of knowledge or because they cannot adapt to the style of expression. For example, some people re rely on rationality in this discussion, whereas others might prefer prefer emotional expression. Moreover, their opinions are usually ignored by the influential groups. In the case we observe, external and internal exclusions are actually interact. On one hand, less speaking excludes women from the decision-making process or abase their inferences. And on the other hand, women who join the decision-making process may be phased out from dominance because of their subordinate roles and tendency to speak less. Thus, the decision-makers are succinct and dominated by men, and women's voice uh, gradually disappear, raising the interaction of external and internal exclusion. Okay. What's the implication of our finding? In this paper, Actually, we are not trying to reject the idea of deliberative democracy. It is important to be reminded that in terms of gender equity, deliberative democracy compared with representative democracy is already a progress itself because it includes more women. However, as a prerequisite to finding a solution to the problems as critics see it, we need to identify such elements as setting, reason, topic, uh, or rhetoric of reason, reason giving, giving, which might contribute to impede women's participation. Secondly, women still need to be in power outside the conference. So for a disadvantaged group, social movements are still irreplaceable. Lastly, we need to remind our audience uh, and our readers that this case study has its limitations. OK, thank you. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Our second paper is presented by uh, Tang Wenhui from the Institute of Sociology at Sun Yat-sen University um, and is co-authored by Danielle Belanger of the Institute of Sociology at the University of Western Ontario and Wang Hongzhen, Institute of Sociology at National Sun Yat-sen University. And the uh, Tang Wenhui, I don't know the, the uh, educational background of the co-authors. I'm sorry, I didn't do it my homework. But uh, Wenhui was uh, my classmate and good friend do, while she was working on her PhD at Harvard University. And the topic here is Unmatched Expectations of Gender Roles in Taiwan-Vietnam Cross-Border Marriages. Thank you. Thank you for Shelley. Um, Today, my paper's title is A Matched Expectation of Gender Roles in Taiwan-Vietnam Cross-Border Marriages. This paper is written by three authors. I'm the first one, and Daniel Belanger is a professor in U uh, University of Western Ontario, and Hong Zhen Wang is also my colleague in National Sun Yat-sen University Institute of Sociology. Um, I. I want to say um, my paper is basically uh, at the very beginning pro uh, uh, stage, so i like to hear from you about how to uh, revise and make it better. First, first of all, up to the end of 2009, there were more than 100,000 Vietnamese women married Taiwanese. Um, here we Authors explore the cases of cross-border marriage in which family conflict involved domestic violence perpetrated by the husbands and or the mother-in-laws and other family members. I like to stress, um, not all Vietnam, Vietnam Taiwan cross-border marriage are problematic <laughs> because according to Wang, 
at least 90% of Vietnamese wives who marry Taiwanese men were satisfied with their marriage. That's from a, a um, interview and questionnaires. We're quite sure that's the correct percentage. <laughs> However, their marriage are frequently reported in mass media and impress people that Vietnamese wives are deviant. It means that they use international marriage solely as a tool to improve their family's poor economic situation. So they deserve to be badly treated. That's what we know from the newspaper. But here we argue that this perception is largely an interpretation from the dominant class and ethnic ideology that fail to capture the complexity of women's motives and life experience, either before they come here or after they are here. So we'd like to know more about why the few um, Vietnamese wives here, they are not happy. What's going on? Why the mass media always um, always describe them are bad, they, are, they have deviance, so they get family violence. So we interview uh, 16 Vietnamese abused wives and four husbands. Two of the husbands are those 16 wives' husbands. Another two is not. They are from other place. We find them by social worker. We did our interview mostly in the Prevention Center for Domestic Violence of a local city government. Others, we, we did some interview uh, um, in the restu uh, Vietnamese restaurant in the local place. They, or the uh, 16 Vietnamese abused wives, they go to ask for help, either from police office, police office or they go to uh, Bureau of Social Affairs directly. So now our interview is that the age, the wife's age is about 25 years old. The uh, education, the average education is six years, so it's quite uh, low level education. The, the years they live in Taiwan is about five years in 19, 2008, so it means they arrived here about 19 or 20. Um, quite young. Most of them met their husband through a marriage broker, except one. Um, and only two of them have uh, Taiwanese IDs. Six of them have no idea about ID and even never thought about how to apply for it. So, uh, or, or wives live with in-laws, except one. And seven of them not only live with parents-in-law, but also other relatives. F five of the husbands are unemployed, and six of them have unstable incomes. The husband's average education is about 11 years. So our analysis show that conflict emerged primar primarily because of divergent vision of gender role expectation between Vietnamese wives and Taiwanese patriarchal family, not only husband. Um, from husband's side, the Vietnamese wives were primarily constructed by their uh, Taiwanese in-law and husband as wife, mother, and daughter-in-law, and thus were expected to stay at home, raise their children, perform domestic work, and provide care for all family members, including elderly and other family members' children. But in contrast, Vietnamese women migrated to Taiwan with the expectation of quickly working outside home in order to help support their parents and other relatives in Vietnam, especially when their husbands are unemployed or don't have stable income. They're eager to work outside. No matter what the life in Taiwan is, most Vietnamese wives try to send money home to support the NATO family, as the data shows that 90% of the families have better economic life after their daughters marry Taiwan. 
for husband. For abused Vietnamese woman, it's also a way to escape from unhappy, unhappy marriage, domestic violence, and build Nanking connections, empower themselves. They learn Chinese outside, not at home. Child care also, but uh, in the uh, patriarchal family, on average, the Vietnamese women are pregnant within six months of coming to Taiwan. If they deliver a baby, 73% reply that child care is done by themselves. Just like Xian complained that when the baby cries, he means the husband be begins to blame me for not being capable of care caring for it. He scores me, beats me, and kick out from the room to other place to sleep. And also the domestic work is regarded by the husband's family as wife's work in the name of love, as Xian complained. All domestic work was done by me, and from time to time, my father-in-law gave me $1,080. It's about 30 US dollars a month. One month was only worth 30 US dollars. I was pregnant, and I did all the work, and it was worth only 30 US dollars. So Xian decided to work outside and uh, you know, she, she sometimes make money uh, about uh, one day about 1,000 a day. Um, so I like to uh, analyze why uh, the woman, Vietnamese wife eager to work outside, not only because they want help their natal family. They also bring their gender culture from Vietnam. We didn't, most people didn't realize that. In Vietnam, their gender culture is uh, different from here in Taiwan. They have bilateral kingship system. It's different from here as patrilineal kingship system. And they have less rigid and less male dominate than our Confucian model here in Taiwan. For the female labor participation rate is 73, much higher than here in Taiwan, it's about 50 now. Why husbands are opposed to their wife's desire to work outside? Or many husbands told us, some, some husbands think that their wives should stay at home, work for family, not, not work outside. And some other, believe that the wives are obsessed with money and uh, they, what they want only to send money home to Vietnam. It's not good here in Taiwan. If you are a married woman, you should not uh, give your money to your natal family. It's not loyal to your uh, um, marriage. And by the way, the husband think the, they have potential that the wife might have an affair with other men at work because we need to know the, the always the 40 something hus Taiwanese husband get married with 20 or under 20 years old Vietnamese wife. So the Vietnamese wife is beautiful. They are very, uh, you know, uh, energetic for everything, you know. So, <laughs> so the husband said, yes, I beat her, but it is not point. Many, many husbands say the 重点 is very seriously. What's the 重点? What's the point? One husband said, in Vietnam, it is female going out to make money, while in Taiwan, it is male going out and female staying at home to care children. This woman should understand Taiwan's custom. They should not leave children alone and do whatever they like in Taiwan. So um, husband use violence to maintain their masculinity when the uh, Vietnamese wives run, uh, run away and work outside and make their own money. Sometimes husband have real or imaged infidelity. This cause lead to more severe restric restrictions placed on the wives and may trigger or aggregate, aggravate existing domestic violence. 
In contrast, Vietnamese wives find their marriage unsatisfying for various, various reasons, including insufficient access to income, husband's unemployment and drinking problem, as well as their psychological and physical abuse. And uh, you know, the abuse, uh, the psychological or physical abuse always uh, uh, happened very early in the first or second years since they are in Taiwan. But they, they will ask for help until very late, until like for their fourth or fifth year here in Taiwan, because they don't have enough um, resources to understand what's going on here. And they, gradually, they work outside. And they hear from outside, never, e even neighbors or their uh, co-workers or their boss will tell them, go to report, because we have, we have initiated the uh, preventive uh, prevention of domestic <coughs> violence law just 11 years before. So uh, the Taiwanese uh, friends will tell them, go to report. So the end, finally, what's going on? Vietnamese wives often run away for their, from their husband, work in Taiwan independently. Sometimes they keep their children with them. Sometimes they cannot. Mostly they cannot have their children because they don't have enough money. They always live with their Vietnamese friends uh, somewhere and they go to help in the restaurant, in the Vietnamese restaurant, and share a room or, you know, uh, uh, they, and they run away. And the Taiwanese, what will do the Taiwanese husband? They will uh, go to report the, their their wives disappear and uh, ask police how to find her. And uh, b finally, they prefer to file file for divorce and deport the wives back to Thai to Vienna. If the Vietnamese wife don't have ID yet, they must. If they if the husband successfully uh, filed for divorce, then the Vietnamese wife must go back to. Vienna. So the um, wives work very hard to try to get the uh, custody right from the kids. If they, if she, if she can get a joint custody right, then she can stay. Otherwise, she must go back to Vienna. And the most uh, interview uh, Vietnamese wife, they don't want to go back to Vienna because they, uh, they think here is better because they can work here and they can sometimes find another husband. OK, thank you very much. All right, thank you. Our next paper is by Professor Pei Jiao uh, from the Department of Sociology at, at National Taiwan University. And uh, she has her PhD from Northwestern University and is ably assisted here today by her student at uh, Taida, uh, Yifan Wu, on the topic of Taiwanese youth migration to China for higher education. Um, we'd like to thank Shelley for inviting us, and thanks for um, Academia Seneca for organizing a conference. The paper we are presenting today is based on an ongoing project about Taiwanese students uh, going to China for higher education. They are usually called Taisheng in Taiwan. Um, the Chinese government has opened official channels for Taiwanese students to attend Chinese higher education institutions since 1985. Um, as you can see, during a period of 1985 to 2000, the number is still quite small. However, the number has uh, risen dramatically. In the year of 2004 alone, almost 1,800 Taiwanese students headed to China for study. Um, let me briefly address the literature on student migration. Uh, the focus has mostly placed on students from the periphery moving to the West for higher education. And uh, moving to study helps these students cultivate human capital and gain access to mobility in the global labor market. And host countries tend to adopt deregulation policies to facilitate the recruitment of foreign students. Not only can they make a profit from the tuition fees, they also benefit from the talent and the labor of students after their graduation. This literature provides a useful framework for us to analyze Taiwanese students in China. However, 
Many puzzles remain to be answered. First, China is not a traditional receiving country of student migration. The government has no interest in active recruitment of international students as future immigrants because, um, because employment is already very competitive due to a sufficient supply of labor within the countries. Therefore, unlike most receiving countries in the West, the education quality in Chinese university is not globally praised. For Taiwanese students, China offers a relatively similar cultural and language environment. In short of the attractions of exotic cultural exploration and distinct language capital that they can acquire while studying in the West. All right, how do I go back? Okay. Secondly, due to the political tensions across Taiwan Strait, academic degrees and professional certificates are not yet mutually recognized between Taiwan and China, especially from the Taiwan side. Um, particularly in professional areas like medicine and law, Taiwan has held an exclusive policy toward degrees earned overseas, especially from China. Finally, some people might question if the moves of Taiwanese students to China constitute a case of international migration. Perhaps some people might wonder this student, these Taiwanese students are not studying abroad but returning home. One case in point to compare would be Taiwan's policy to recruit overseas Chinese students, Chao Sheng largely from Malaysia, Indonesia, Hong Kong, Macau, and Burma. This policy constitutes what Rogers Brubaker calls homeland nationalism. During the Cold War era, the KMT regime claimed to represent the real China under the support of the United States. KMT's Chinese diaspora policies helped maintain the symbolic order necessary for the ruling legitimacy of the exile regime. For overseas Chinese students who return home to study, Republic of China played the role of surrogate homeland. So the research question we pose in this paper includes the following. About the macro context, we ask, how do, does the government of China establish special channels to recruit Taiwanese students? How did these institutional frameworks change over time in relation to the shifting dynamics between China and Taiwan? And is the policy toward Taiwan students similar to Taiwan's policy to an overseas Chinese student? On the micro and the macro levels, we asked what motivates Taiwanese students to study in China? What do they wish to earn while studying in China? What kinds of capitals do they wish to cultivate or accumulate? Was the migration decision made individually or as a family strategy? How do their motivation differ across profession and major? Um, about our research methods, uh, very briefly, uh, we basically use uh, unstructured, semi-structured, in-depth interviews. And we interview 31 females, 28 males, 30 undergraduate, and the rest are graduate students. And uh, in order to reach a sample with sufficient diversity, we try to interview people across majors, as you can see in the chart. Uh, next, I will let uh, Wei Fan to present the empirical findings of our paper. Um. We want to know uh, what are the logics behind China's policy on recruiting Taiwanese uh, students. So basically, we see like uh, special institution benefits toward Taiwanese students are offered by China government, and China government has treated these students more and more like nationals or quasi-nationals of China. Uh, around uh, 1980s, uh, when the Chinese government decided to open up the market, they then welcomed the Chinese diaspora return to China for investment and education. In 1985, the Chinese government first opened official channels for Taiwanese students to attend <coughs> Chinese hi higher 
education institutions. So since then, they offer special care for students from Taiwan, Hong Kong, Macau, as well as their overseas citizens. They set up separated and special examination only all only for these students and all with lower requirements. Um, and so in the first period, uh, compared to the local students, these four groups students uh, are treated more like uh, foreign students. They had to pay higher tuition fees and were under special administration. In the second stage, uh, in, the second stage uh, in 1986, Beijing government announced that students from Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan should enjoy the treatment of nationals. National. So more channels are offered and for these students with more scholarships and cheaper accommodations. They even offer student discounts on transportation, etc. So uh, on this, in this stage, the quasi-national treatment of Taiwanese students was not much different from those uh, from Macau or Hong Kong. But later in 2005, uh, the tension of cross-strait relations that time further pushed a, ta a Chinese government uh, to uh, offer benefiting policies toward Taiwanese students. Taiwanese students now pay the same amount of tuition fees as local ta Chinese students do. Some provinces like Fujian, which is really close to Taiwan, even offer job opportunities in local governments in favor of Taiwanese students. Um, so in terms of the special channels of admission, admissions built for, for Taiwanese students, we uh, conceptualize these multiple venues into three major types of channels. As you can see, um, in China, local students have only one way to get into college, that is the one national entrance exam. But as we can see in this chart, besides the special examination offered for students from Taiwan, Macau, Hong Kong, they are, uh, they are also allowed to multiple ways of admission, which we describe as side doors. And such as easier transfer, pre-university program, and uh, free applications. So interest and, and interestingly, we found some of our uh, informants get into schools by unofficial channels, either by manipul manipulating their personal connection uh, uh, using backdoors, or use forged documents. And so, okay. Okay, so uh, I'm going to analyze the, the common mo motivation of these students to move. Uh, I'll quickly go to go through the uh, first three, the first three uh, motivations. When we say that there are better quality of education in China, it is especially applicable for those who want to study Chinese history, literature, or Chinese medicine, where China provides authentic knowledge about the real China. And second, lower cost of study for sure. As you can imagine, the lower cost compared to study in other countries abroad, and there is no need to practice foreign language for these students from Taiwan. And the third, easier access and admission to famous university or like Beida or popular majors, since not too many people in Taiwan can get into the right ones that they want to. Um, I want to address more on the direct or indirect influence of the families. The first uh, situation happens to those students who are the second generation of immigrants from Taiwan to China. Uh, they study there in China because their upper middle, upper middle class parents expect them to stay or even to take over the family enterprises or factories there. The long-term local ties or local knowledge buildings are what they care most, not on the issue of degrees being admitted by Taiwanese government or not. The second situation about the family influences, uh, they, these students are pressured, some of the students are pressured by their parents to go to China for better education opportunities. Uh, there's a typical case uh, like, the typical example for those students who want to attend medical schools they tend to study more uh, in China because doctors are considered a top job, especially for families in Taiwan. The last situation, we've seen families sending children to China as a strategy of risk management uh, of cross trade relation. One of our informant, his father asked him to study in China similar to buying a family insurance because they thought reunification between Taiwan and China was soon to be happened. His father uh, sent him to China to see whether the student um, can survive and the whole family can then save an, an, an alternative route to survive. 
uh, the, set, uh, the fifth motivation, the future employment in China is definitely the major one of the major uh, motivations. But we want to address more on only limited groups of students with special majors or professional backgrounds can get closer to this dream. For, uh, uh, for, for example, the people want to study in uh, and have a career in finance, China is perfect place to develop their p career path. But in other cases, when applying for a job or an internship, Taiwanese students are as disadvantaged as foreigners in the highly competitive job market in China. For students who, want, who study territory-based territory professions such as medicine, it is extremely hard to be permitted to a job. Uh, the last point, I found uh, curiosity about China among many of our informants. Some people talk about their motivation very vaguely as, I just want to take a look. Here, I'll read a vivid example. Lily traced his, uh, her curiosity about China back to her previous and encounters with Chinese visiting students. During her college year in, ta in, China, in Taiwan, she met a group of elite students from Beijing University. These talented Chinese students surprised her greatly. After I met these students, I was so shocked that I decided to take a serious look at China. We thought they were poor and uh, underdeveloped, but in fact, they were not at all. The rising pro progress of China becomes surprisingly impressive, for, especially for these uh, Taiwanese students. When posed uh, against the negative image that, Taiwan, uh, that, that China is poor, undeveloped, and uncivilized place, these uh, contradictory perceptions about China turn into strong motivation for these Taiwanese students to explore China, a place that seems so close yet so far away. Well, we have three conclusions in the paper. First, whereas student migration is most often portrayed as a deterritorialized consequence of deregulation policies. We argue that the institutional framework for Taiwanese students in China is highly re-territorialized. China's policy to offer preferential treatment for Taiwanese students has less to do with economic interest, which would mean recruiting talents for future immigration, but has more concerns with political interest which is maintaining the symbolic order of ruling legitimacy. To compare with um, the KMT's recruitment of overseas Chinese students, we found an obvious difference exists in these two policy contexts. We argue that the KMT's policy is better described as a policy that contributes to the imagination of the symbolic boundaries of homeland while China's recruitment of Taiwan students is closer to a project of nationalizing diaspora that constitutes the territorial boundaries of national sovereignty. Second, the existing literature regards international education as a means to the achievement of flexible capital accumulation. For Taiwan students who study in China, the logic is somewhat different. Taiwanese students intend to earn is not simply the official degrees. They hope to convert and accumulate social capitals and cultural capital. Social capital referred to local networks for their future business and career in China. For the cultural capitals, uh, it includes uh, not only local cultural knowledge about China, but also um, the students wish to benefit from what we call mediated internationalization while studying China. They believe that they can reach a more internationalized campus and market in China while enjoying the comfort of studying in a familiar language environment. Finally, our studies address how family decisions shape student migration in significant ways. Many decisions to study abroad in China were, were made by their parents rather than themselves. By sending children to China as a strategy of spatial deployment, these families wish to maximize the economic interest of their family business 
or to minimize the political risk given uncertainty and tension between Taiwan and China. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much to all our paper presenters. I am particularly appreciative of their careful attention to the time limits. The bell has not rung once yet. Uh, I'll see if I can't ring the bell with my comments here, though. Um, I'm going to comment first on the first two papers, and then uh, Huang Changling will comment on the third paper. The two papers that uh, we heard initially offer a, a pretty bleak picture of gender relations in Taiwan. And this picture, I think, is well supported by other kinds of data. Uh, Taiwan's birth rate is as low as any in the world, pretty much. It has, for Taiwan at least, what most people would consider to be a high divorce rate and a high rate of marriage refusal. Uh, by women in particular. And this is a relatively new development. I've recently been doing a lot of reading about um, gender in Taiwan. And up until uh, even the mid-1990s, it was sort of a truism in the literature that however negatively women might view marriage, they saw it as inevitable unavoidable. And this is just no longer consistent with the data, especially for educated, highly educated women. Uh, we also see in Taiwan a kind of mismatch between male and female marriage expectations. So you have women try, traditionally in, in Taiwan marry up in status, and yet women tend to be more educated on average than men. So you have this sort of excess of women at the top of the marriage market who can't uh, find a suitable partner. And you have also then a corresponding uh, excess of men at the bottom of the marriage market who also can't find partners. And this is uh, a major reason for marriage migration from Vietnam, other places, mainland China, as we'll discuss in the next panel. Uh, and there's still gender discrimination in employment and all kinds of other things. So the bleak picture that they've given you, although it is based on uh, two very specific kinds of research, I think is not atypical or somehow misrepresentative of the situation in Taiwan. The papers dig into this set of issues in interesting and creative ways. You know, we've read a lot about gender in Taiwan over the years, but these are some new approaches and, and new issues to be thinking about. And I think in both cases, the, the finger of blame points squarely at the same guilty party, which is gender ideology. Let me start with the uh, paper by Fan and Zhang. Uh, here they are extending a familiar research program, the kind of uh, differences in communication styles and interactions between men and women, to a very interesting and, and hot new context for Taiwan, this idea of deliberative democracy. Deliberative democracy is a popular concept in Taiwan. It's also a very popular concept in mainland China, where I think in some cases deliberative democracy is seen as a, a kind of preferable alternative to what we in the West might call real democracy, or <laughs> perhaps more, more neutral terminology, representative or electoral democracy, right? Everybody sit down and talk about it. Somehow sounds less scary than having an election um, to people in China. Um, but I think that the, the deployment of deliberative democracy in Taiwan is actually for a much more progressive end. So what do they find when they sit, and I just, have to commend you for watching those endless hours of other people's <laughs> meetings. Oh my gosh, you know, they said they 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 coded. This is a content analysis of just interminable jawing by <laughs> by college graduates, so you know it was bad. Um, and what do they find? They find the men talk more, they talk longer. The women are unlikely to express strong views, 
Uh, and when they do have an opinion, it is rarely incorporated into the group's decisions. The men violate the rules of the process and treat it as a competitive process. They want to win. Uh, and the way for a woman to be heard in this process and to have her views reflected in the final report is to attach herself to a good alpha male and let him take the credit. It sounds just like my department meetings. <laughs> So, you know, what's new in this paper? We've all sat through this event. Um, what is new in this paper, I think, and very, very interesting, is the resilience of these gendered communication practices in the face of the planning, intentionality, and good intentions of the deliberative democracy process itself, right? The whole thing is to, supposed to be set up so this won't happen. And what you find is, it happens anyway. And I think that speaks to gender in deliberative democracy. Um, and if gendered communication practices are robust, despite all of the efforts of the organizers of this event to uh, give everybody an equal opportunity to speak, et cetera, if gendered communication practices are robust, then many other potentially less visible and less measurable uh, inequalities in communication practices are probably robust too. And that's where, where I think this is really a very uh, important contribution. So maybe we can't see the class differences among uh, the participants as easily as we can see the gender differences. But if the gender differences are this strong, then that, that certainly at least suggests that we should be looking at class too. And all the other uh, aspects that uh, define and uh, constrain opportunities in those kinds of communicative settings. On to the uh, uh, Tang Wenhui's paper, and then I'm going to get back to a few questions for everyone. Uh, Tang Wenhui shows us a very large gap in gender ideology between some subgroup of Taiwanese, although I think that the gender ideology you're describing for Taiwan is not limited to the husbands of these Vietnamese um, abused women. Maybe they're a sort of extreme case, but I, I don't think that they are uh, wildly out of sync with the rest of society because of all these other uh, gender issues that I've, that I've already mentioned. Um, so you show this huge gap in a gender ideology between the Taiwanese husbands and the Vietnamese wives. And I think this one's really interesting because it goes against our stereotypes about the correlation between economic development and gender attitudes and other kinds of social attitudes. Um, there is a widespread, I would say, tendency, and certainly you see it in your informants, the Taiwanese husbands, uh, to connect or to associate higher levels of economic and social development with more progressive attitudes towards things like, towards social issues, including gender. Um, but what we see here is that Vietnam does not have what is defined in Taiwan as traditional attitudes toward gender issues. Even these very poorly educated and very young and disempowered Vietnamese women have in some sense a more progressive attitude about their own potential and their own expectations for employment and for uh, engagement with the larger society than their Taiwanese husbands who are much more educated, much more empowered, um, and, and much older. And I think that's very interesting. And it reminds me of something Michael was talking about yesterday um, about the uh, the uh, chickens, actually, the, the restrictions on uh, importing chickens from Jinmen to Taiwan, which you, I think, very wisely pointed out, is mainly about, uh, you know, Taiwanese poultry producers don't want the competition. But there is this kind of social hygiene component, you know, that, that, that the 
these other places are backward. That is to say, the mainland Vietnam. These are backward places, and they're 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 out of they're uncontrolled. They're they're dangerous, and they they have these kinds of they're a source of contagion. So you can make the argument about uh, mainland poultry that you shouldn't import it to Taiwan um, on the because you can activate the anxiety about hygienic about the unhygienic backward third world place and and Taiwanese will buy into that and they'll pay more for their chicken because you know it, it they know that it's clean how we connect this to the US beef debate and the sort of social hygiene component there I, ha I have to think about that I think I've just defined myself into being a third world a citizen of a third world country um, <laughs> But anyway, you know, I, I think it's really interesting to think about how Taiwanese um, <coughs> stereotype or characterize in their minds these other places as backward, less progressive, and so on. And then in, in this case, very clearly, the, the, uh, the stereotype is just simply wrong. And it may not be that these women are particularly progressive by Vietnamese standards. It's just that Vietnamese culture is different. And it, does, it is not what their Taiwanese husbands expect. So you have this really uh, huge and potentially, for these women that you're talking about, tragic mismatch in expectations. So we see gender ideology interacting with national ideology or national prejudice to create double trouble, um, which I think is really interesting. Now, just to, to conclude so that I don't get saved by the bell, or y'all don't get saved by the bell. Uh, a couple of questions for our paper writers. First of all, why has Taiwan got such a sharply divergent gender ideology for men and women? Why are women's expectations so different from men's expectations when they grow up in the same society? And I'm sure there are people who are working on that. But you know, it's like yi guo liang, liang ge xing bie, yi shi xing tai. I just wonder where that, where that comes from. Um, and why is male dominance so ingrained? You know, obviously, uh, male dominance is ingrained in most places, but it's so severe here in Taiwan that you have this birth rate plummeting to the point where people think the whole country might just die out for lack of babies or be, you know, colonized by, by marriage migrants. So, you know, what's going on here? Where, do, where does this, uh, does it come from? Is it economic? Is it structural? Uh, is it cultural? Or you know, is culture just a kind of excuse that we use to explain things that are happening for other reasons? And finally, you know, what what can be done once you figure out what, why? Then you can figure out what to do. Uh, would better social programs? Which would take the pressure off women to care for the young and the old help to equalize expectations and gender roles? Uh, should employment be restructured in Taiwan to allow more free time? You know, it seems to me that the working hours, the standard working schedule in manufacturing, which is a 12-hour day in a six-day or seven-day week, really does require uh, domestic labor, full-time domestic labor by one person or the other. And it's, you know, even in the U.S. in that situation, it's going to be the woman who's expected to stay home. So, you know, could you, is there a way to change the work week to change the expectations about employment such that two career couples might actually have a, have a fighting chance? Um, also, I, uh, this is part of a conversation that I was having with Wen Hui earlier in the week that's not in this paper, but we were talking about uh, what women acknowledge as work. And that, uh, you know, a woman selling fruit on the side of the street in uh, Shizuan down in Kaohsiung is not working. A man selling fish off a motorcycle on the side of the street in Shizuan is working. He constructs what he's doing as employment. She constructs what she's doing as not employment, just a little something in the afternoon. And you know, is there a way to sort of regularize the structures for employment, for taxation, for a lot of other things that would elevate women's work to the status of work? Uh, and maybe men and women would begin to recognize that uh, women actually were employed and contributing in that way. Uh, 
And then I also think it's really interesting, a lot of the privileges or rights that Taiwanese women have gotten are not extended to foreign brides, the marriage migrants, so that to the extent to which structures have adjusted to improve the situation, so for example, in child custody cases, there we go, um, you know, Taiwanese women now can get custody of their children after divorce so, the, so they can be more demanding in marriage marriage migrants still have a much more difficult time with that. So we've, we've, we've fixed some of the problems to some extent for Taiwanese women, but the uh, marriage migrants uh, still face the old set of rules. So I don't, I don't know the answers to these questions, but I think it will be really hard to achieve psychic unification with the mainland if there is a uh, you know, continuing huge gap in gender ideology, national ideology, class ideologies, and other kinds of ideologies uh, between the two sides. Uh, so I think these papers are actually really do tell us something that we need to know in order to think forward about the future of cross-strait relations. So thank you very much. And our last speaker is uh, Changling Huang from the Department of Political Science. Yes, we did manage to get some representation for our discipline here on this sociologically focused panel at uh, National Taiwan University. Changling has her PhD from the University of Chicago. Thank you. Well, thanks, Shelley. And uh, uh, it's really a very interesting paper since the authors managed to interview 60 <laughs> students. Um, if you read the paper and um, heard from the presentation, they interviewed 60 students. The interview number is large enough, and uh, also the most impressive thing is uh, they have interviewed these people in China, in, major, in, in different major cities, and also in Taiwan. And, uh, we, uh, and, and these interviewed students are all come from uh, diverse disciplines. So in terms of a paper that deal with the, the topic of student migration, uh, I think the math, math methodology itself is admirable enough. So it's really uh, quite impressive and very interesting. I'm going to raise the three questions and my comments comes with the, the, the questions about this paper. The, the first question is, um, about the, the deviance, okay? Um, because the major argument of this paper is that uh, the student migration um, phenomenon from Taiwan to China in the past 20 years uh, is a deviant case from the current literature. And the authors mentioned the, um, the, the, the case is deviant because of two reasons. One is that the Chinese government actually tries to reconstitute the territory by uh, granting Taiwanese students the quasi-national status uh, in their education system. The second is that Taiwanese students who go to China to pursue degrees uh, is not exactly as the, 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 the way Taiwanese students go to um, North America or Europe or Japan to pursue degrees because uh, their purpose is not exactly about uh, pursuing a better uh, quality of education, but to expand uh, their own, uh, or you know, with the anticipation, expectation that they, they would have a better business or career opportunities in the future. Um, I think given the, the, the political tension between Taiwan and China, it, it's probably not a surprise that uh, the, the case for Taiwan's student migration will be somewhat different from the, the student migration um, cases. Um, in other circumstances. However, my, my first question is uh, how deviant the case is. To what degree the, uh, the, the, the deviance um, is um, really very exceptional. The case that, the comparable case that comes to my mind is actually Korea, okay. For example, uh, a lot of the Korean students who also go to China uh, in recent years, and I think the the number is increasing, even though I don't have the exact numbers um, about how, uh, how much Korean students have uh, go to China to study. And uh, uh, given that the Korean student migration pattern is quite similar to Taiwanese students' migration pattern in the post-war period, um, a lot of Korean students who, who also go to uh, North American, Europe, or Japan to, to pursue better quality of education. But Korean students who go to China, I, my suspicion 
is that the reason is probably very similar to Taiwanese students. They would like to um, um, uh, expecting the the, the 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 increasing importance of the Chinese economy and uh, the increasing enlargement of the Chinese market that uh, they eventually will have a better career opportunity if they have cultivated the local knowledge and the local networks if they have uh, a degree from China if they are fluent in this language. And also my impression is that a lot of the Korean students who uh, after they finished their uh, study in China, they eventually were hired by the Korean enterprise in, in, in China. So that's a very similar pattern. So, so to what degree uh, we, we want to argue that the Taiwanese case is very different, I think it, you know, it will be interesting to explore more about uh, the, the degree of deviance. My second question is about uh, the recruitment pattern. It's, I think it's very, very interesting because the authors used the very interesting and uh, to some extent, I think, very uh, precise analogy about the front door, side door, and the back door ways to go to the, the Chinese system, uh, Chinese education system. So my question is, uh, um, what, what kind of impact uh, is the, the, the difference of the recruiting pattern? So for example, if a student who, if a Taiwanese student who entered the Chinese higher education through the back door, would that affect this student's uh, uh, eventual career development? Or whether, um, if, uh, whether there is any difference between going into the Chinese education system through the front door, okay, using the same analogy, like you know, passing exactly the same as, uh, e uh, entrance examination. Um, Will that make any difference? Okay, that's the, 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 the first question. And then the second, the second sub-question, you know, under the, 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 my second question is, uh, uh, is there any difference between the discipline? For example, some disciplines might have more quote-unquote legitimacy um, uh, when, when you talk about pursuing a, a degree in China. And again, if I compare the Taiwanese experience with the Korean experience, for example, uh, if a Korean student who pursue a Chinese literature, or Chinese medicine, or Chinese history degree in China, that still counts a lot in the Korean academic market, as far as I know. But if you are pursuing, a, uh, say, political science degree, for example, <laughs> in China, then uh, that might not count as much in the market. Uh, you know, when when you compare that to pursue a degree in in the states. So is there any you know, different uh, um, sort of like um, um, uh, 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 impact in terms of the, 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 the discipline difference? So that's my uh, second question. So I was trying to connect your two analysis because uh, the paper con uh, consists of two parts. The recruiting patterns, like institutional framework, and then the, the second part is about the Taiwanese students' motivation. So is there any connections? Between these two, um, you know, whether the, the recruiting patterns of the Chinese education system somehow affects the, the Taiwanese students' motivation, or whether Taiwanese students' motivation uh, uh, influenced the, the way they enter the, the Chinese education system. That's my second question. And my third question uh, comes back to the cross strait relations, because um, the the, the conclusion, actually, the conclusion of the paper is very interesting about uh, you know, why Taiwanese uh, students want to pursue degrees in China. And uh, out of the three major conclusions, I think two are politically related. So uh, especially about the, the third conclusion, like the, you know, when the authors talk about the decision, actually, it is a family decision you know, when they send the, the kids to, to China. And uh, you know, according to the authors, that uh, when they send the when Taiwanese families send kids to, to China to pursue degrees to study in China, they would like to minimize the, the family political risk uh, in terms of the political tension between Taiwan and China. My question is, what exactly is the political risk? You know, when we talk about minimizing a family's political risk, because I. I mean, we all know that there is the, the political tension, but how would individual family minimize the political risk? How would the, the, the political risk be, quote unquote, divided individually? I mean, I think that part should probably be defined or conceptualized more. 
Otherwise, you know, I, you know, when I read that part, I was sort of like curious. I was like, what exactly is the political risk? You know, are they going to be, if one day uh, Taiwan is forced to be uh, unified with China, would they not be forced to become uh, Chinese citizens as other Taiwanese citizens? So what exactly is the, the, the political risk that, that involved in these families' decisions? Um, business opportunities, uh, you know, family welfare, those parts is much easier to understand. So um, that my last question is, uh, you know, when we come back to the, the original argument of the paper that the Chinese government want to reconstitute the territory by granting Taiwanese students a quasi-national status in their education system, and the Taiwanese students who go to China to study because they want to expand or increase uh, their career opportunities. So how do these affect the cross-strait relations? Do Chinese government's policy really increase the um, Taiwanese uh, uh, students' Chinese identity? Or would uh, actually um, the, the, the policy might uh, produce some unintended consequence because uh, the, according to the interviews presented in the papers, almost all Taiwanese students who have cultural shocks when they go to China because they expect that it will be the same society or the same social environment in Taiwan, but they, they realize that it is actually a different society. So probably one of the unintended consequences uh, when uh, Chinese government made it much easier for Taiwanese students to go to China to study, but it sort of unintentionally um, allow these students to reaffirm the difference between Taiwan and China. Yeah, and that is my question. Thank you very much, Chang Ling. Um, we have actually some time for questions and discussion with the audience today, so please jump in. Yes, Michael. Thanks very much for a, just a really fascinating bunch of papers. Um, you have to be quiet because there's so many cross straits links. Um, that, uh, so I have, I have uh, well, I'd love to ask comments and questions all three, but I'm going to, I'm going to choose two. Um, so for Professor Tang, I have a question, which is actually not really related to your paper, but it, or no, it wasn't contained in your paper, but it's really driven by something um, Shelley said. To, to what extent is there a hierarchy of backwardness in the perceptions of Taiwanese uh, participants in the marriage market. I'm, I'm, I, I'm curious why a Taiwanese, a working class Taiwanese man chooses a Vietnamese sp wife over a mainland spouse. And whether that's linked to, uh, whether that's linked to the issues that Shelley was talking about, that, that uh, there's, a, there's a perception that uh, um, spouses from there's a perception that spouses from societies that are perceived as more backward are going to be more suitable. And I wonder how, how, how the perceived backwardness of Vietnam and the perceived backwardness of the mainland relate. <laughs> Whew, that was a, there was a minefield. <laughs> um, and my second uh, question, no, so my second comment really feeds off several things that Professor Huang mentioned. It has to do with thinking about the the the, the it was clearly a political scientist turn of phrase the the level of de the the type of deviance the d the degree of deviance uh, in the um, the uh, the um, Taiwanese students in the mainland case there's three three issues I want to uh, raise with you um, uh, the first is I'm always struck when I'm in China doing field work with colleagues in the weeks after the Gaokao at the extraordinary negotiations that they are involved in with local students, d domestic students, and the various back doors and side doors and, and uh, uh, okay. <laughs> um, and so I wondered, you know, to, what to what extent are the patterns of recruitment different for Taiwanese students as opposed to mainland students who also get in on their merits but they also get in through connections. They also get in through bribery uh, and so on. Um, the, 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 the second, I'll be very quick. A second, but now because I'm so quick, I'll be disorganized. A second comment, the influence, the influence of family. Uh, I was just rereading Philip Kuhn's book, uh, Chinese Among Others, 
which is about traditional, uh, which is about the, the, the different ecologies of overseas Chinese migration. And that, that phrase could come from the conclusion to that book. Right, that overseas Chinese families and uh, both both families in the so, you know, it's kind of classic. The historian says this to the social to the social scientists. What about thinking more historically? Um, it's not unique that families. It's not unique to Taiwan that Chinese families use um, migration for various reasons as a risk mitigation strategy, uh, as a diversification strategy. And so again, what's what's the what's the the, the deviance here? Um, to what extent is this simply a new expression of a historical pattern? Um, and then the, the, the final point, um, which, which really was stimulated by your comment about a sense of Taiwanese identity. Um, the, the, Tim, we were at a panel where, where the, 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 the conversation was about the consequences of sending minority students to the big cities. Tibetan students and Uyghur students to the big cities for education. And it, the consensus seemed to be, I can't remember who, 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 whose argument it was, the consensus seemed to be this is a total failure um, because they go to Beijing and are treated like dirt and realize they're Tibetan. Right? So it's a policy of assimilation that largely fails. Right? They, they return home with a very strong sense of ethnic identity and, 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 and often anti-Han sentiment. I wonder to what extent there's a parallel there. So sorry for some very desultory comments, but wonderful papers. Thank you. I'd echo what Michael said about the uh, quality of the papers and the discussion. I really uh, learned a lot. Two, two uh, comments on the, um, uh, I guess on the Tang et al. paper first, is I'm wondering uh, to what degree the women who who uh, the Vietnamese women are a self-selected, more entrepreneurial group of women to begin with, and therefore they would be more inclined to see this as an economic opportunity that they shouldn't be confined in the household, but should have opportunities to earn money on the outside. The other, I was surprised by the, um, the idea that Vietnam was not uh, the, the, the comparative Confucianism, because I think in many senses, Vietnam is thought of as very Confucian. Uh, and and that, so I, I would s s like to see more exploration of that. And finally, I think there's a lot of good comparative opportunity uh, of Vietnamese women marrying into Taiwan and Vietnamese women marrying in Korea. And there, I think they're more likely to marry rural, very low educated men. Korea also has the problem of uh, declining marriage market and mismatched and very low population uh, growth rate. So I think that that, um, there's a lot that be considered there, and Korea is also considered the most Confucian of all the Confucian societies. So it would be interesting to, to see the Confucian angle. Then uh, my other comment was on uh, the Lan and Wu paper, um, and I think it would be interesting to do a comparative study of mainland students who come to Taiwan. Uh, a, a friend of mine I hadn't realized until uh, was here last year is working at a at a university, and he goes over to China all the time to recruit mainland students to come to Taiwan. In Taiwan, you had this rapid expansion of the number of schools, and it's sort of Luan Chibazao, and, and a lot of them, there's not enough students and quality and so on, and so they see mainland students as a great way of uh, filling their ranks. And then on the risk, I was surprised, Professor Huang mentioned, on the risk reduction. I think here we might have a generational issue, is for those of us, I, I keep referring to those of us of a certain age, um, the, risk, the risk, I think the risk concept was that if Taiwan becomes part of China, then it depends on your class background. And, and that if you are, well, if you were a mainland, uh, a KMT general or a KMT official, then you would be marked as someone who was not dependable and therefore would be likely to be purged. And knowing the history of China, those, those people who themselves or their parents had been victims, or their relatives they heard on the mainland had been victims of some political campaign, and this is still common on the mainland as well. People don't trust the policies, sustainability, any policy. And so they're worried that if they're on the wrong side of something, that they're likely to be purged and therefore, or accused, given a hat. And therefore, they're always conscious of trying to um, cover their bets and diversify their risk. So it, it didn't strike me as a, as a strange concept. First of all, I must say that uh, this is a very interesting Saturday morning. Usually, I don't go to 
Saturday morning seminars, especially by political science. <laughs> but this morning, it's very different. OK, I have to commend the organizers um, yeah, for doing this, uh, bridging out to other disciplines, especially bringing in this feminist and gender ideology perspective. Um, I have a couple questions or maybe comments. Uh, one's for, uh, first one's for Wen Hui. I, I think Wen Hui has brought up a very uh, sensitive and uh, issue, social issue uh, Taiwan society is facing today. Uh, but I think it, the question interesting most is not what you described in your article, uh, the, the, the treatment of Vietnamese women, the abuse of violence against them, but the high degree of satisfaction of the marriage migration, 90%, you mentioned that. I don't know whether, uh, what does that mean? What does it mean? How, how can we account for it? If we, we take uh, Shirley's uh, comments on social hygiene, the background is the otherness, uh, then, then how do we account for that 90%? I don't know whether, of course, I have some suspicion and doubt. I could never answer the question if I were to <laughs> ever ask that one. Um, <clears throat> so, so I think maybe that that's the real uh, question, uh, a theoretical or sociological issue we should ask. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, if the ideology interpretation is right, so that this men dominant um, uh, patri patriarchal masculine uh, thing uh, is correct. I, I believe they are correct and they need to be addressed. But but then you have this ninety percent of satisfaction. Okay, so that's my puzzle there. Okay, okay. Um, uh, uh, the other questions about Lan Peja and Wu's. Uh, one more minute. Okay, uh, question and uh, comment. Uh, question is very simple. Uh, in your study, do you include those graduates from Taishan Xueqiao, or they are graduates from Taiwan high school or Taiwan uh, classes? Okay, because. Taishan Xueqiao may be a different situation. The children grew up in, in, in China and studied there, and they studied Taiwanese textbooks uh, imported from Taiwan. Okay, so, so how do you compare them, or do, do you include them? That's my question. And my, um, of course, I expect more from your research, especially from your first conclusion on re-territorialization. Okay, see. I think if you wanted to make a strong argument with that, you need to compare with Chinese policy toward other overseas Chinese, like from Southeast Asia, Malaysia, and that sort, uh, in order to make a strong cases of that. Thank you. Echo the thanks for very nice papers. Um, I have just two very short questions, and I'll keep them brief for, to leave you all time to respond. Um, for Tang Wenhui, I was very curious uh, in thinking about the kind of rhetoric or discourse that the Taiwanese family members use to express dissatisfaction with Vietnamese wives' gender expectations. And do they ever frame it uh, in relation to Vietnamese socialism? Um, and my comparison here obviously is with the mainland where there's a whole discourse available for people to talk about how Chinese women especially have been trained in a more aggressive gender style for older women especially through cultural revolution experiences so I'm just curious whether socialism comes up at all in the Vietnamese case and how it's articulated what are the moments or the the frameworks through which that's expressed um, and then for Lan Peja and uh, we find your paper very, very interesting. And I'm uh, great coming from my own interviews in China with uh, couples who are making decisions about education and also a student of mine who worked on um, primary and secondary education in China, um, Taiwanese students. So I'm curious um, whether you are also in thinking in a comparative vein, looking at those students who have gone up through various different educational systems in China, Taiwanese students going through the different ones, and then their different decisions about higher education. I was struck last summer in my interviews by many couples saying, uh, Taiwanese couples or mixed marriages saying they can't get their kids into local schools. And the assumption is if they can't get their kids into the top local schools, they can't go to top Chinese universities. They won't pass the Gaokao. So then they're thinking about international schools perhaps 
going abroad to the West for higher education. So looking at that dimension of the comparison as well, in addition to Taishang Xue Xiao. Yes, uh, I join in uh, commending the papers, which were uh, very interesting. Uh, I'm particularly, I have a qu question for uh, Ms. Tang uh, for her paper. Uh, I was uh, reminded somewhat of the familiar Tolstoy line of all happy marriages are alike and every unhappy marriage is unhappy in its own way, but it seems like your statistics suggest that there actually are some factors that are actually quite common across these unhappy marriages. I have one sort of detail statistic question. Uh, if, if, I, if I may, which is that you mentioned uh, there was an exception to uh, several, uh, one exception to several of your uh, characteristics that there was one that hadn't gone through broker, one that didn't have an ID card, one that didn't live with in-laws, and I'm wondering if that was all the same one, or, oh, okay, <laughs> so it's not quite that consistent. Um, and I was also wondering for you, you had uh, uh, four husbands, and th you, you gave three reasons why that, uh, that had come up in discussions with them. Did they basically all give the same reasons or were they, uh, one gave one reason, one gave another, or were they basically all coming back with the same reasons for their dissatisfaction? And then I guess my final question is um, on the uh, broker issue, uh, and this may feed into why Vietnam or why China as well as, as some of the other points, but I'm wondering um, the extent to which uh, the brokers were, in your experience, were operating in um, mainland China. I know they operate quite openly and sometimes recruit practically entire villages in Vietnam, um, but I'm wondering if it's a much more covert process in China. Um, thank you. I w just want to make one quick point before I let the, the panelists um, answer the questions about the the methodology that uh, Wen Hui used in this study. It's really extraordinary, and it's very interesting to read in the paper. You know, the idea of interviewing batterers. These are a wife abusing men who submitted to this kind of scholarly interview uh, is really very interesting and I would love to read the interview notes someday but um, required an incredible amount of bureaucratic cooperation from the local um, Social Affairs Bureau in the city where she was working because it's not so easy to get in the interview in the intake room with abused women and it's even harder to you know go out to the house and, and talk to the guy so it really is extraordinary um, we have about 10 minutes left which gives us three minutes per person for some quick responses to all of your very interesting and engaging questions and let us go in the re okay let's go in reverse order we'll uh, start over here. I'll first start uh, answer some of the question. Um, uh, first, about like the differences between uh, side door, back door, and what's the impact on the, those students. Um, uh, I would say like the side door is official uh, channel uh, uh, offered by the China, China, Chinese government. So like the Korean students, they won't share this kind of channels. So this is what uh, the institutional, uh, typically only for the these um, students from Taiwan, Macau, and overseas citizens. And uh, so I, I say like the back doors, yes, uh, we, we know that the um, the control of the degrees or the admissions of in China was not that clear cut. I mean, like there are some backdoors even w within the lo for the local students. But uh, in my interviews, I just found out that uh, the officials who to to uh, offer the admissions tend to mm, in favor for Taiwanese people, a Taiwanese student even better because they think like, okay, Taiwanese student, we welcome you with a lower uh, lower requirements. So this way they kind of try to help some of the backdoor with like personal connections. Yes, you can, you can, you can get in. And uh, I want to, uh, I want to answer about the, um, uh, to some question about like whether there's a differences between those uh, Taiwanese student who or attended in the mainland China in the Taizhang Xue Xiao, or local local primarily uh, like elementary school, local elementary school, local high school <coughs> students. Yes, we uh, we include uh, we inter uh, interviewed some of the students 
who study in Taishan Xuexiao read the text from, tai, from Taiwan. And very interestingly, um, the, the, China, the Republic of China, the title of the Republic of China always was canceled. Uh, they have the censorship in, in their textbook. Okay, so we interviewed some of them and also some who study in the local, who were who immigrant, who are secondary immigrants, uh, second generation immigrants in China, but study in the local system of schools. Um, they can all go to the same channel, which is the special examinations for the ta Taiwanese students. So uh, in, in, my, in my observation, I don't really see the differences in terms of their, uh, their um, percentage to get into the college because they are all within the same system to sp uh, offer with a special uh, examination. But in, in terms of the ident identification issues, these two groups of students, uh, in my interviews, they um, t tend to realize that they are Taiwanese students more and more when they get graduated. So, but some also, a small portion, proportion of them tend to uh, feel like it's good to live in China without too many uh, identification issues. So I just want to point out that yes, the identification issue is very important, um, but I don't really see the minority group as like those students, um, yes, maybe they are minority in, the chi in China, but in, like in my generation, I see more and more students who realize that they are Chi they were Taiwanese instead of Chinese, even they live or study in Chinese. Thank you. Okay, how deviant is the case? Um, thanks very much for channeling to remind us of the case of Korean students in China, but I still think that case fits better into the typical uh, paradigm of student migration because they go there to learn foreign language and to explore a, a different cultural environment. Um, but of course, we, we might be think of us like different typology of student migration in the future, but I still have to emphasize that this case is very special in, in terms of institutional framework, because it's like, like one government is like pulling pulling students and offering like preferential treatment as quasi-national, while the other government is totally in denial of cross-border migration by refusing to recognize the degrees. Um, and and uh, for this, uh, the local students do have back doors to get into higher ed education institutions in China, but I, what is interesting in this case is there are official side doors, you know, like um, what we mentioned briefly in, in the presentation, like you could get in the Chinese University as Cha Ban Sheng and Yu Ke Sheng, practically once you are registered in a Taiwanese university or you get admission to a Taiwanese university, God knows how easy it is nowadays, you can practically get in a Chinese university. And that's very special venue open for Taiwanese students, not even for Hong Kong and Macau students. And uh, regarding the question uh, Mao Gui raised about uh, to compare with overseas Chinese students, um, actually, the definition of overseas students in China is very different from Taiwan. In Taiwan, it's more descent based. So you don't necessarily, uh, you don't necessarily need to have a, a, a ROC ID to be recognized as uh, uh, Hua Qiao. But in China, the official definition for, for overseas Chinese actually uh, PRC nationals, PRC nationals who reside overseas. Uh, so uh, Taiwan actually fit in this category, Taiwanese students. So um, in other words, uh, what we like to, that's why I emphasize that uh, in the KMT policy, it's more like a symbolic uh, boundary of the homeland. But in the case of China, it's, it's more like a territorial, territory based. Uh, but one thing I also like to mention that is actually the KMT's treatment to overseas Chinese has more like ideological education, I mean in the past. Actually, very interesting, uh, China does, does not require Taiwanese students to attend political lessons, Zheng Zhiku. So they actually are not, I like, cultivate them with the, the, I don't know, communist ideology or whatever histories. Uh, so that's actually very interesting difference. So uh, 
actually, uh, the consequence, we'd like to emphasize that this is a policy of re-territorialization. But for these students, the migration might bring in unintended consequence as repositioning themselves as Taiwanese. That's another thing we, we didn't mention in the paper, but we'll talk about it in another paper. So it's another, another type of re-territorialization. So some students embrace the idea of going to China as a homeland, but while living there, realize it's a totally foreign country, and they realize I'm Taiwanese, I'm, I'm not Chinese. So, so that's a very common situation. So I'm going to stop here. <laughs> Okay, thank you for Shelley's comments. Uh, I think it's really interesting to know that the same phenomenon also exists in your department. <laughs> okay, yeah, regarding the class issue, uh, because the data is not available, so we didn't um, do class analysis in terms of uh, uh, participation or decision-making power, but I think if gendered communication or gender inequality of decision-making still exists in deliberative democracy, and then other social inequality like class issue or class inequality uh, might still be there. Okay, and to uh, address Shelley's bigger question, like you know, what male dominance is so engraved? I really don't know. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know, what can what can be done? I think uh, based on our observation, I think we still need a stronger women's movement. So the uh, male, a uh, men, especially male scholars, are welcome to join the efforts or the. Dialogue. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. I, uh, my part, I think it's too many questions. I try my best to answer. If I didn't answer well, that's because I don't have answer yet. Okay. First of all, thank you for sharing these comments. Um, uh, I think there have two ways to solve this kind of uh, social problem. First of all, the, the, the women want to work outside. The first obstacle is child care because under six years old, the child is too young to take care. So the husband against their wife work outside. So may, maybe public service need to re revise some policies for because here in Taiwan, it's very market oriented under six for child care. It's too expensive for them to find a nanny or to send to the private kindergarten. By the way, the uh, gender education is quite important for husband's side. In, in Korea, Korea, if you want to have a phone wife, you must take some courses. And here we don't, and so we suggest that if you want to go somewhere find a, how, uh, a wife, uh, you must learn Vietnamese culture or something like that. We suggest that, but government don't agree. So, um, so maybe this the, the answer for Shelley. And uh, for Ma Gui's question, I think you are right. Many feminists don't comfortable about this 90%. <laughs> why they satisfied? <laughs> but for why I call this reference because I like to stress we don't need to think about or their family is very bad or they have everyone. If you are cross border marriage, you must you definitely have family violence. It's wrong. Mostly they are quite happy. The Vietnamese wife is happy here. They are enjoy their life here, and they have good relationship with NATO family because they send money back. So everything is fine, but some extreme cases, the 90% say they are satisfied with their husband or their marriage. I think they are real satisfied. So it's a questionnaire interview, uh, survey. I think if they say, OK, I, I just trust they, they feel OK. So the extreme case maybe need social policies help. So I just focus. Those say, I am not happy. I report. I, I got abused. OK. So uh, next one, I answer a question about uh, Vietnamese socialism. I think it's, for me, it's not about political ideology. I think it's related to the economic situation. Because in Vietnam, the rural, rural family is too poor. So women, wives, need to find some work outside. Otherwise, they cannot survive. So women have tradition, working tradition. They probably make few money, but still help their family. So the, the, the daughters, they learn from their mother. Or my informants say their mother work outside. They do some jobs outside, either trading something or so 
they think there's no more. Why can I have so good chance here in Taiwan? Why cannot I work outside? And uh, they have that kind of uh, whole uh, family system. They always send their kids raised by other relatives. So here, a lot of Vietnamese wives send their kids to other Vietnamese wives. They uh, take care together. But their hus Taiwanese husband against this kind of situation. When they come, come back home, they say, where's my kids? And you know, where's my wife? They cannot find their wife and kids. And the Taiwanese husband get very angry. They don't agree the kind of way of raising kids. Okay, that's very middle class ideology. But the under Taiwan underclass of Taiwanese husband, you know, believe that's that's good. You mother should take care of kids. Okay, by themselves. And about okay. So can I go on? Okay. Mm. You're in the coffee break now, though. So. <laughs> um, why? Why the? Why the Taiwanese husband choose Vietnam wife, not China Chinese? I don't did the research about Chinese migration, uh, marriage, so I cannot say things about that. But for me, I know that why Ta why Taiwanese husband choose Vietnamese. That's because they ask their friends, they ask brokers. And sometimes they feel Chinese wife is too strong. They can speak Chinese. They, they are not so good as Vietnamese wife. <laughs> so they choose Vietnamese wife. By the way, most Vietnamese wife have their sisters also get married with Taiwanese. So it's the kind of social connection they will introduce their sisters or their you know relatives um, get married with Taiwanese men because they think that's good because they can take care of each other in Taiwan so all my informants here they have sisters in Taiwan even three or four sisters or get married with Taiwanese hu husbands so um, I think I just tabudo, <laughs> so I can answer later if I, we have time to talk. Later. Yeah, we have so many good questions, but I'm going to answer Malgue's question because I know why. How 90% are satisfied? It's called low expectations. <laughs> okay, we'll have a coffee break for about 10 minutes and then resume. Thank you very much.